Thanks very much, Lenny. Thanks, everyone, for coming. This is uh, what I'll do. I'll just I'll very briefly uh, kind of explain the genesis of the work, and then uh, I'll run you through what uh, I think are our, our ten kind of what I'm calling headline findings, because the word key is such an incredibly boring one. So I'm now using the term headline as much as I can. And they're not necessarily the ones that are, well, put it this way, there's four reports that we've, we've published. And these, these findings come from all of them. Uh, and I put them together into a presentation. Um, so what were the aims and the methodology of this research? Well, yeah, to give it a bit of context, as, as Lenny said, it came out of two um, things, really. At the end of uh, 2011, I think it was, there was the famous Busan High-Level Forum on Aid Effectiveness. And some people thought that was the beginning of something. Uh, others thought it was the end of something. I think um, it certainly was the end of something. And whether it was the beginning of something new is yet to be uh, defined. But this report, is, or the, this series of reports, is, is an attempt by ODI to contribute to, I suppose, um, defining what the next phase of aid effectiveness work will be. Um, and it also comes out of, and, and Chip will talk more about this, um, a movement within USAID to localize aid. That's to say, to put more money um, from USAID towards, um, directly towards local actors, be they government, uh, private sector, or civil society actors. And that last point, in fact, is one of the things that I think immediately marks out the work as substantially different from the Paris era, but somewhat in the spirit of the Busan era, uh, in that Paris seldom, if ever, and it began to uh, uh, mention, but certainly didn't emphasize the role of the private sector and civil society, um, whereas Busan began, uh, well, quite clearly does so. Um, and that's one difference. And then the second difference that I'd like just to emphasize is that we were deliberately focusing on a range of different country types. So not just stable, low-income countries, but also including fragile states in our analysis, and middle-income countries, those countries that um, are either moving away from aid dependence or really for decades have not been aid dependent and receive a very small amount of their uh, annual income in aid. What are the different um, findings for those different country types? So the, the aims of the research, to analyze how valuable localizing aid can be for strengthening systems and organizations in recipient countries, the focus on system strengthening, not just achieving results in the short term, not just keeping costs, transaction costs down, which were two very clear parts of the Paris agenda, but strengthening um, uh, systems and organizations. But like I said, much broader than the, the Paris focus on strengthening country systems, by which basically they meant uh, the state. This is about strengthening other parts of the society as well. Um, to give guidance to donors on how most effectively to localize their aid, and to assess any supply side blockages uh, to localizing aid, by which we mean, re why is it that donors find it so hard to do this stuff? Um, and the method was quite simple, a preliminary, a preliminary literature review to, research, to, to hone our scope and our hypotheses. Uh, and then a broader analysis of key literature, and then three country visits uh, to Guatemala, Liberia, and Uganda, and interviews with experts and practitioners. And so, as I said, we produced four papers. Firstly, a scoping paper. Uh, secondly, the really the main report, it's pretty long, which is why we haven't printed it, but you can find it online and you've got an executive summary. Um, and then two further papers, one on risk, and one linking up a localizing aid approach to or what we call a whole of society approach to trying to link up all the different sectors together. So what are, what are, our, what are our headline uh, messages? Well, the first one is that localizing aid to the state can work in all country contexts. We found that, and it's natural, that donors are particularly worried about localizing aid uh, in fragile contexts or where institutions are weak, usually because they're worried about corruption, but also simply very slow progress. Um, you know, we could achieve X in a week if we did it ourselves. If we go through the government or through local organizations, it's going to take us a year. Um, 
those concerns are valid. But if donors are interested in strengthening systems, then localising aid to the state can work in all country contexts, including where, where, where institutions are very, are very fragile. Because even in those places, uh, oversight and engagement will be incentivised and donors will, to a certain extent, buy themselves a seat at the tables where decisions are made. So there are reasons not to localise aid. Let's take them into account. But let's not argue that it doesn't work. Uh, and we think that's a fairly bold and new uh, statement. Having said that, we've, we're, you know, t that's, that's one generalisation. But we're quite nervous about making too many generalisations with this work, partly because our scope was very large. And we don't, without qualification, say localise aid. Um, there's insufficient evidence to support the view that localising aid will generally be, a more effect, be, be more effective at strengthening systems than non-localised aid. Other aid modalities have positive track records. It's very hard to tell uh, causality. Country context matters a great deal. In some countries it will work. In some uh, situations with some ministries, uh, with some organisations, elsewhere other modalities may be more appropriate. Um, so while there's plenty of evidence that localising aid does work, we're not prepared to say, if you localise aid, you'll be more likely to strengthen systems. Um, what we do say is donors really should have it in their toolkit because those donors that can't localise aid are going to be um, at a weakness. Um, sometimes it's the right thing to do, so you should be able to do it. Um, that is, is new and also quite challenging because certainly... Uh, throughout the Paris process and still today, um, the orthodoxy is, uh, you know, to localise more aid, partly on principle, as a uh, gentleman at the back emphasised in a previous session, uh, partly because the case is made that it works. Uh, and we're saying, well, uh, we can't give total support to that view based on the evidence we've looked at. Um, and the third message is, having said that, given the currently very low proportions of aid that's localised, but there is a case for localising more aid um, because it's likely that um, it's likely that localised aid will be an appropriate tool in more contexts than it's currently being used in. And I suppose that will be particularly the case in fragile states. So um, while we're not prepared to generalise that it will generally be a better modality, we are prepared to say it's likely that donors should be seeking ways to, lo to localise more aid, given the currently very low proportions of aid. I hope you followed all the logical complexities in those last few um, slides and question me on them later. And that's a challenge to donors. Um, more boldly, we say that more aid should be localised to the private sector, and within the report you'll find reasons for that. Um, increasing local productivity, increasing the, su the, the number of uh, firms. And we offer a range of specific recommendations for how donors can support um, uh, local firms uh, with the policies that they use, procurement policies, supporting government to, uh, to, to, to use policies that favour indigenous and local firms. And uh, it's worth saying that that's the area, and Alistair led on it, that um, there was least work already done on. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a relatively original uh, aspect of the work. Um, let me just explain briefly uh, how we look at uh, localising aid to non-state actors. The, if the aim is for the aid provider to reach and support local firms and civil society organisations, uh, one route would be to support them directly. It's a route that very few large donors will take. Um, smaller donors are more likely to. But large donors tend to look for large, what we call apex partners, uh, who then manage a portfolio of local partners. And the main difference is between uh, what we would call route two, uh, where you have a local apex partner, and that would be a donor localizing its aid or Route 3, where a foreign apex partner is used, classically a partner from the donor's own country, uh, and that would be non-localised aid. Uh, we emphasise that information should always be shared 
with the host government, something we'll come on to in a sec, and also that um, uh, there's a multiplier effect so that local firms and CSOs, when they're supported, will obviously work with and have contracts with uh, other local firms and CSOs. Two minutes left. So these are the, these are the um, policy implications. Some of them seem incredibly simple, but speaking to um, uh, representatives of donor agencies, they're, they're, they're still not um, internalised properly in, in donor procedures. Simply making local private sector development an explicit objective for all aid that flows in directly to it, favouring local firms, uh, and, and a number of others that I'm going to have to skip over for now. International civil society organisations still have an important role to play. This could be considered to be a surprising um, finding. You know, we, we haven't come out and said, yes, just go ahead and localise aid. Um, that will strengthen the, the national civil society. In some contexts, continuing to channel aid through international partners may well be the appropriate modality to support national civil society, quite ironically. Uh, but um, sometimes for political reasons, for capacity reasons, um, it will be the right thing to do. Nevertheless, it can also very often be the right thing to do to localise aid. Um, it can mean more money staying in the country and may tap better into local knowledge. Um, but again, an equivocal um, response on that. And uh, in, in a previous session, um, representative from DFID asked you know, whether there was in fact too much emphasis placed on the specific aid modality. You know, does it matter so much if aid is actually localised or not? And I think one of the points coming out of this research is you know, perhaps we do place too much emphasis on actually the aid modality, and there's a whole range of other things that we should be looking at much more. Um, for instance, core funding as opposed to project funding um, came out as a, as a big one in our work on the civil society. I'm going to run through them now, Lenny. Um, there's a bunch of policy recommendations. Um, Sixth, this is a general point, Paris is not the only route to aid effectiveness. The Paris Declaration implies that the route to more effective aid is, is kind of unidirectional. There's a number of steps to take, increase percentages of a certain things, reach these targets. Whereas we uh, say there are likely to be trade-offs. If you want your aid to be more effective to achieve X, then you might want to do Y. If you want your aid to be more effective to achieve A, then you might want to do B, and B and Y may be slightly different. I haven't put it in algebra terms before, but I hope you followed that. Um, again, it's um, a somewhat new um, way of thinking about aid effectiveness, not one you'll see uh, in, the, in the conventional aid effectiveness literature. Um, Localising aid is no more risky than non-localised aid. This is something that uh, Alistair will be talking about in a second. Uh, and it really matters what risk you're looking at. So while it might be more risky in fiduciary terms, um, when, you, when, when you think about risk as achieving, as not achieving development objectives, uh, it may be less risky. And uh, the kind of phrase that we use here is wasting money is as bad as losing it. Uh, and again, that would be, that's challenging, especially in terms of public messaging. One more minute, if you can, Jonathan. Yeah, I've definitely won an extra minute then. Okay. If you can be quick, these last few slides. So the eighth one is donor information is still very poorly shared. It's, again, it's something that everyone knows, um, and it's reinforcing a strong trend in aid effectiveness work at the moment. But nevertheless, it's, it's quite astonishing how little uh, or, or, or yeah, how poorly uh, information is shared between donors uh, uh, with governments and with other actors, including civil society, general, general public. Um, just a quote, we don't know when, where, what donors are doing with other sector actors, how can we plan? Um, Ninth, the complexity, of the complexity of systemic change should be internalised by donor agencies. Everyone who's worked in development aid knows how complex uh, it is, especially when you're localising aid and trying to support country systems. Um, this, this point is not just saying, oh, look, everything's compl complicated. It's saying actually take steps to uh, internalise that complex complexity in the processes and policies and guidance of donor agencies. And uh, we think it's quite obvious. And uh, the last point uh, is focused more on investing in human capital than developing rule books. Again, 
if anyone knows of the uh, report on aid effectiveness that talks about human capital, that talks about uh, having capable and capacitated decision makers in post for a decent length of time in country so that they are well equipped to make difficult decisions rather than you know, achieve 50% of this target by, you know, you know what I mean? Um, you know, tell me where that report is because we, we didn't see it and we think there's, there should be far more emphasis on the role of sensible decision makers rather than um, trying to corral everyone into a particular way of working. Great. I will leave it there. Thank you, Jonathan. I think it was helpful to have that overview of your, um, of your rich findings, I think, from across the analysis. But I will be a little bit tougher on our two other speakers, <laughs> just to ask you to keep time so we can bring in questions and get reflections from the floor. And Alistair, I think you're now going to tell us what this might mean for how donors approach risks um, in, in, their, in their work. 